Hi everybody, welcome back to the channel. My name is Ollie. I'm a junior doctor living and working in the northeast of England. Welcome back to my Draw Along Anatomy series where today we are going to be talking through the anatomy of the stomach, the gross anatomy, everything that you will need to know for your medical school exams. Now before we begin, if you're new to the channel, a subscribe would mean a massive, massive deal to me. And if there are topics that you'd like to see me address in this sort of format, doesn't just have to be anatomy, can be physiology, pharmacology, whatever else you like, let me know down in the comments and let me know how you're getting on with the series in general. But well, let's jump right in. Okay, now as my GCSE art teacher used to say to me, no postage stamps, we need to use the entire space. So give yourself plenty of space when we're going to go through and draw this because we're gonna need it for labels. So we're gonna come down from the top here reflect upwards away from ourselves all the way out and round and then loop back on ourselves at the bottom so we've got this lovely big long sweeping curve what we've ultimately got here is i've got one side of the esophagus coming down here reflecting back upwards into the main body of the stomach down and round and then ultimately descending through the pylorus and into the first part of the duodenum then similarly on the other side, so the other side of our esophagus, following ourselves very briefly, then coming back round on ourselves. We'll put a little dink in here to use that later, and then again following round the first part of the duodenum. So here is our basic structure. You're already doing great. Now I am actually going to close off the top of our tube here because we're going to be doing some perspective on the tissues later on, which is going to be useful. So we're going to be talking about tissue layers. So we're just going to put a little hole in there to remind ourselves that we're looking at a 3D view. And we'll do the same down here at the bottom. So we're sort of looking at a tube end on here. So this is the sort of gross overview of the stomach that we've got here. So let's start labeling some of the structures. So here we have our esophagus, OE esophagus for those of us who are not American. And we can label the other end as well, because as we said, we know the esophagus comes down. We have our mouth goes into a food pipe and an air pipe. So the food pipe, the esophagus comes down, joins the stomach, and then ultimately continues into the duodenum. So we can label that too. This is the first part of the duodenum specifically. And now we can move on to labeling the main parts of the stomach and different parts of the stomach have different anatomical names. So the first part of the stomach that we're going to name is the cardia, which I'm going to draw on here. It's essentially the part that is closest to the esophagus, but before we have this large upwards curve. And it's not super important to go into masses of detail about, but where the cardia begins is a line known as the Z line or the point at which the esophageal mucosa starts to change into the gastric mucosa, the tissue that lines the inside of the stomach. And it's this that tells us that we're coming through what's called the gastroesophageal junction, or the junction of the gastric region, the stomach, and the esophageal region, the esophagus. So when all of this stuff comes together and we start to transition into the stomach, this is when we transition into the cardia. The next region to know about in the stomach is the fundus, or the highest point. Now fundus is actually one of those general anatomical terms that is not specific to the stomach. Specifically what it means is the part of a hollow organ, so it could be the bladder, it could be the uterus, it doesn't have to be the stomach, that is the furthest away from the opening to that bag. Imagine a sack of money, if I were to hold that, the fundus would be at the bottom. However, because when we're thinking about the stomach, our point of reference is the far end that goes into the digestive tract, the furthest part away is the top bit or the fundus. And something that's very clinically relevant, because the fundus is the highest part of the stomach, as in it's physically, geographically the highest, if there is any air present inside the stomach, which there usually is a small amount, the stomach is a bag full of liquid ultimately, so there'll be a liquid layer with air that will always rise to the top, this is actually the gas bubble that you can see on a chest x-ray underneath the diaphragm. It's sometimes called the gastric bubble, and this is where it is, the fundus. Now the next named region of the stomach is the body or corpus, depending on whichever terminology you want to use. But this is essentially the vast majority 
of the stomach, the body or the corpus. And then as we approach this region down here at the bottom, just so you can see where I'm talking about, this is the region that we call the pylorus. Now pylorus, interestingly enough, is the ancient Greek word for gatekeeper. And this tells us, the pylorus, this tells us what structure is gonna be located here. And this little divot that I've put in, which is the pyloric sphincter. So we're gonna label that right now. And this is the sphincter. So a sphincter, if you remember, is a ring of muscle that closes, opens and closes like this. And this is ultimately what controls the rate at which digested food contents enter your bowel. Because the digestive system is ultimately just a continuous tube. If you were to eat something like an apple and it drops through your esophagus into your stomach, we've got big bits of undigested apple. We need some time to digest that food and to get all the nutrients and things that we need out. We don't want everything just shuttling straight through the digestive system. So while the very acidic stomach is digesting everything, we need to keep this pyloric sphincter closed tightly so that stomach acid and all of the other things that the stomach does can have their time to work. More specifically, just this sort of entrance way to approaching the pylorus and the pyloric sphincter, this is called the antrum or the pyloric antrum. And in turn, this area, the bit that follows, is called the pyloric region because it's where the pyloric sphincter is. Anatomy is so easy. But now we're gonna be a bit clever. I said we were thinking in 3D today, which we are, I'm not a liar. We're gonna give ourselves a nice big cross section because we need to think about the layers and what's going on inside the stomach. So what I need you to imagine we've done here is we've simply taken a scalpel and cut away the entire side of the stomach. So this is a window. We're now looking through the wall of the stomach onto the inside and there are two layers that we have exposed when we've been doing that which we'll talk about in a moment because now let's assume this is all of our acid down here. This obviously isn't representative of real life, but just humor me for a second because the things that we need to talk about on the very inside of the stomach are these folds called rugi. And what these are is imagine that the stomach is a sort of shriveled ball like this, it's not very big in the average human, but when we eat food, depending on the amount that we eat and the amount that we can eat, the stomach expands to adapt to whatever we've eaten. And rugi are these folds which allow the stomach to compress and uncompress, but fundamentally they massively increase the effective surface area of the stomach. And if you think that it's gonna be secreting digestive enzymes and hormones and everything else that the stomach needs to do, as well as being very collapsible. These rugi, these folds, are what allow the stomach to do that ultimately. The more tightly folded it is, the more ultimately it can expand and have as maximal a surface area as possible. So next, we are going to talk about the muscular layers of the stomach, as there are three. The stomach isn't simple in terms of its muscular distribution. It's got lots of different functions. And one of the things that the stomach needs to do is it needs to churn food. It's one of the ways in which our food is broken down. So the first is obviously mastication, chewing with our very powerful jaw muscles, which imparts a huge amount of force. We've got very sharp developed teeth, specifically for tearing meat and for grinding vegetation, things like that. But the job is not done. When food gets into the stomach, it becomes submerged in acid, as we know, but the stomach also mechanically churns our food, and it has different orientations of muscular fibers to help it do that. And there are three layers, so from most superficial to least superficial, or outside to inside. The one on the outside, which I'm gonna draw on like this, and as the name suggests, these fibers run longitudinally from top to bottom in the same orientation as the stomach. So if I were to just draw on some lines, they would follow around like this. Following the structure, I'm gonna take those off because it's messy, but you get the idea. And having fibers running longitudinally would help the stomach constrict top to bottom like this along its length. The next layer is the circular layer and they go right to left. So instead of top to bottom, this is now going circumferentially around the stomach, and this allows it to squeeze in this plane, in the horizontal or axial 
plane. So we've now got top to bottom movement like this. We've now got a squeezing motion from outside to inside with our circular layer. And then our third and final layer is the oblique layer. So let's come around like this. And oblique essentially means to run at 45 degrees like this. So it's not running either top to bottom or left to right or outside to inside as it really is because it's a 3D structure. It's running at a tangent at 45 degrees. So if this is top to bottom, this is right to left, our oblique one is coming at an angle like this. And once again, we've now got contraction this way, this way, and now this way to ensure that the stomach can essentially pull from every direction to mechanically churn food. The next thing to touch on is the four layers of the stomach. So we've talked about the muscular layers already, but there are four overall layers that make up the structure of the stomach. I'm sorry to be confusing, but it makes more sense to tackle these layers from the inside out. So we're going to start with the mucosa. So the mucosa is the secretory surface of the stomach, the layer that gives out all of the acid, the layer that is in contact with everything on the inside of the stomach. Then next, it makes sense that if you have the mucosa, then you have the sub mucosa, the layer that is immediately below the mucosa, makes sense. Then third, we have what's called the muscularis, and this is simply the muscular layer or the layer that is made up of these three muscular layers that we've talked about before. And then lastly, number four is the serosa, or the layer that is essentially on the outside and covers everything and is ultimately continuous with the peritoneum on the inside of our abdomen. So this is the protective cover that sits over the top of everything else. Now, before we move on to thinking about the blood supply to the stomach, which is how I want to close off this video, there are a few more named features that I want to make sure you're aware of. The first is the greater and lesser curves. So this is the first one here, the greater curve and the lesser curve is the small one here. I'm gonna just label it on the inside of here. This makes sense, greater curve, it's the bigger curved area of the stomach on the outside if you like, and then the lesser curve the area that sits on the inside enclosed as the esophagus runs down on the inside towards the pyloric sphincter. The greater curve is where a large sheet of the omentum, part of the mesentery, on the inside of the abdomen hangs down. Now there are two more points that I want to quickly tell you about. These are more for academic interest really. But this point here, the highest point of the fundus, the very top point, is called the fornix gastricus. And the second point that I want to show you is down here, and it's called the angular incisure, or the incisura angularis, as I'm gonna call it here. And all this refers to is the slightly upwards notch, and it depends essentially on how distended the stomach is or isn't as to how pronounced this notch would be in an anatomic specimen. But when you come down, you come into the pyloric region of the stomach and it comes up towards the sphincter as it will curve round towards the duodenum, there's essentially a small upward notch. I'll show some images on the screen to try and illustrate it better. And for the sake of completeness, before we move on, this plane here, you will remember where we will find the pyloric sphincter is the L1 anatomical plane. So let's talk about blood supply. So let's just very quickly give ourselves another nice big stomach to work with. We can start to think about the blood supply. So our big daddy vessel here that we're gonna use just to, to landmark ourselves, and I'm gonna draw my label out the way because we're gonna need plenty of space, is the celiac trunk. And this is where all of the vessels that we're gonna use for this explanation, this is ultimately where they arise from. And you'll remember that that comes off at approximately T12, the level of the 12th, thoracic vertebra. 
And to me, when you're trying to revise the anatomy of the celiac trunk and the blood supply to the gut in general, with the celiac trunk, it's best to start with the three main branches every time because then you won't forget them. The first and the simplest is the left gastric artery, which is simply going to go up and then loop back down and follow the lesser curve of the stomach. Nice and easy, great place to start. And then that provides branches to this aspect of the stomach as it goes. The next one, the one that everyone remembers, is the splenic artery, which has this wiggly, what we classically call tortuous path. And just for reference, this is traveling behind the stomach here. That is our splenic artery. We didn't label left gastric properly, did we? And then as the splenic passes behind the stomach, it gives off all of these vessels to the far side of the body of the stomach and the fundus. And these are simply called the short gastric arteries. So let's come back over to our celiac trunk and the vessel that goes and travels right, and I'm gonna take it right over this side. We're gonna go in and give ourselves a bit more space, but this is the common hepatic artery. So the name tells us two things. That tells us hepatic, that it's ultimately going to arrive at the liver, and common tells us that it's going to split off into lots of sort of daughter vessels as it goes. And the first of these splits that it's going to do, we're going to draw on here, it's going to come round and down, once again passing posteriorly to the stomach, but this is the gastroduodenal artery. As the name tells us, it's going to supply part of the stomach and then go on to supply the duodenum. Then after the gastroduodenal has come off, we need another branch which is going to come back on itself and follow around the rest of the lesser curve of the stomach. And just as we have up at the top here, the left gastric artery that came off the celiac trunk, this that we've drawn around here, this is the right gastric artery. and that anastomose is in the middle with the left gastric. And this is how we get the circulation to the lesser curve of the stomach. These two vessels simply join together. Now, once these two branches have been given off, we've got our first and second branches. This is where we get what's called the hepatic artery proper or the proper hepatic artery, which will ultimately go off to the liver and split into the left and right hepatic arteries, but we don't need to deal with them right now. And I want to briefly return to our boy here, the gastroduodenal artery, because this is clinically very important. And the reason that it's very important is that if someone is prone to getting stomach ulcers or they have conditions which will lead to the formation of stomach ulcers, perhaps they have H. pylori, perhaps they're a very heavy drinker, perhaps they are using NSAIDs with no gastric protection for long periods of time and they begin to develop ulcers. If you get ulcers in this distal part of the stomach here, in the gastroduodenal region, the big thing that everybody worries about is an ulcer perforating backwards through the gastroduodenal artery, which is a big high pressure vessel. And this is gonna cause somebody to lose very large amounts of blood very quickly. So this is danger territory and it's something always to bear in the back of your mind. If an ulcer is gonna develop, this is one of the regions where we are really worried about them developing. And just to give you an illustration as to where these things are going, the gastroduodenal artery splits into the anterior superior and the posterior superior pancreatico duodenal arteries as the name suggests goes off to supply part of the pancreas and part of the duodenum and then we need to complete the picture finally i asked you to remember the lesser and greater curves later there's obviously a big gap in our diagram from the gastroduodenal artery comes a very big and important vessel called the right gastro epiploic 
artery, sometimes called the right gastromental artery. As I said before, if you remember that the omentum, this big sheet of mesentery, hangs off the greater curvature of the stomach. This is the vessel that supplies all of this. And then lastly, we're simply joining the dots. As you will have guessed, from the splenic comes the left gastroepiploic artery. And there you have it guys, that's the blood supply to the stomach as far as you need to know it for your exams. It, it's honestly not too bad, I think with blood supplies in general the best way is simply do these schematic diagrams and draw them over and over and over again until you can remember it, like the back of your hand. There's our main drawing again. Thank you so much for watching guys. Please be sure to hit that like button for me, leave a comment, subscribe, and don't forget to go and check out my website, ollieburton.com, for more videos just like this. And if there's anything that you'd like to see specifically, let me know down in the comments. Take care and I'll see you next time. Bye.